Welcome back to another episode of This Week on Channel 9. I'm your host, Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Developer Advocate. And before we get started, I want to disclose that this week we recorded a bit early, this time because of the .NET Comp. So there will be some stuff that we miss, but there was so much news, I didn't want to take a week off. So let's get into this week's dev news. First up, a follow-up on the Azure outage at the South Central U.S. data center last week. Now, I said that I would point um, out the postmortems and other information as it became available, and it is. So on the Azure status history page, there is a preliminary root cause analysis, and I've linked to that in the show notes, explaining what happened and how each service was ultimately impacted. And um, I'm going to quote from that page now. In the early morning of September 4th, 2018, high energy storms hit Southern Texas in the vicinity of the Microsoft Azure's South Central US region. And multiple Azure data centers in the region saw voltage sags and swells across the utility feeds. Then lightning caused electrical activity on the utility supply, which caused significant voltage swells. And these swells triggered a portion of one Azure data center to transfer from utility power to generator power. And additionally, these power swells shut down the data center's mechanical cooling systems despite having surge suppressors in place. And initially, the data center was able to maintain the operational temperature through a load-dependent thermal buffer that was designed within the cooling system. But once the thermal buffer was depleted, the data center temperature exceeded safe operational thresholds, and an automated shutdown of devices was initiated. And this shutdown mechanism is intended to preserve infrastructure and data integrity. But in this instance, temperatures increased so quickly that in parts of the data center that some hardware was damaged before it could be shut down. And um, a significant number of storage servers were damaged as well as a small number of network devices and power units. And while the storms were still active in the area, there were on-site teams that took a series of actions to prevent further damage, including transferring um, the rest of the data center to generators, thereby stabilizing the power supply. Um, now, to initiate uh, recovery of infrastructure, the first step was to recover the Azure Software Load Balancers, or the SLBs, for storage scale units. And the second step was to recover the storage servers and the data on those servers. And this involves replacing failed infrastructure components, migrating customer data from the damaged servers to healthy servers, and validating that none of the recovered data was corrupted. Um, now, this process took time due to the number of servers damaged and the need to work carefully to maintain customer data and integrity above all else. And so the decision was made to work towards recovery of data and not failover to another data center, since a failover would have resulted in limited data loss due to the asynchronous nature of geo-replication. Um, so despite on-site redundancies, there are scenarios in which um, a data center cooling failure can impact customer workloads in the affected data center. And unfortunately, this particular set of issues also caused a cascading impact to services outside of the region. Um, there are more details I'm not going to read aloud. You can check out the link in the show notes. But obviously, this wasn't the outcome that anyone wanted. Um, and the VSTS team also made a post with a full postmortem, including information about why VSTS wasn't able to fail over to other regions, which as I just explained, was kind of one of the problems. And basically, the team explains what happened and also says that moving um, forward, it plans to address failures within a region by using availability zones when possible. But the broader problem comes down to weighing the pros and cons of having failover to another region, even if that means data loss, because having synchronous replication across regions isn't possible at this point in time for every service that also needs to be fast. And so Buck Hodges, the director of engineering for VSTS, he explains it all better than I could in his post, and he also lays out plans for what will happen moving forward. Look, as I said last week, outages are never fun, and we apologize for the downtime and business impact this one may have had. Moving on to happier DevOps news, VSTS has a new name. What? VSTS, or Visual Studio Team Services, is now known as Azure DevOps. And before any existing customers freak out, know that the VSTS you know and love is still around, but it is now called Azure DevOps. And additionally, the various parts of VSTS have been separated into five different components, which makes it easier for teams to fit the tooling they need into their specific workflows. And so the components are now um, 
um, Azure pipelines, Azure boards, Azure artifacts, Azure repos, and Azure test plans. And Azure pipelines, which is a CI CD system, it connects with any Git repository, and it has an app in the GitHub marketplace so that it's easy to get started. And after you install the app in your GitHub account, you can start running CI CD for all your repositories. But as I said, it works with, with, with any other uh, Git system as well. But even better, open source projects can use Azure Pipelines for free, getting unlimited CI CD minutes and 10 parallel jobs. I love it. So check out the show notes for links uh, to the announcement post and a slew of videos showing off what is new and how to get the most out of Azure DevOps. And there's also a link to the Azure DevOps keynote from earlier this week. Um, and there's going to be more opportunities to learn more in the near future. And in more Git news, there is a great new GitHub pull request extension for Visual Studio Code. And this extension is amazing. It basically lets you handle all of your GitHub pull requests directly inside VS Code. So you can collaborate, comment, review, and validate. And honestly, this is a game changer for anyone who spends a lot of time dealing with PRs. Um, check out some of the videos I've linked in the show notes for more information and to see how this works. I'm in love. It's so good. And one of my favorite things about this is that the extension is powered by some of the new extension APIs in the latest release of Visual Studio Code. And its open nature means that anybody can write an extension for Visual Studio Code that provides in-editor commenting and capabilities to review source code hosted on their own platform. So I think it would be great to see this extension um, used to kind of create a similar uh, extension for other Git systems like, like GitLab. And speaking of Visual Studio Code, the August 2018 Python extension for Visual Studio Code is now available. And this update includes faster and more reliable debugging, improvements to the language server preview, and various fixes and enhancements. So check it out. And in Channel 9 news this week, the .NET Conf was this week, and there was tons of great content. Now, I'm recording this before the conference took place, so I can't share specifics, but check out the show notes for links to every session so you can check out on what you might have missed. And there are sessions on .NET Core and ASP.NET Core, as well as C Sharp, F Sharp, Azure, Visual Studio, Xamarin, and more. And in other event news, Microsoft Ignite is on September 24th through 28th in Orlando. And I'll be there along with the Channel 9 crew. So if you're in town for the conference and you see me, be sure to say hello. And if you can't be there in person, we will be live streaming great content and keynotes from Ignite all week. And now it's time for my pick of the week. So it is Tuesday as I record this, so I'm sure that I'm missing something super geeky. There might even be a big tech event happening. I don't know. But I'm going to do my best. And uh, this year is the year that the Mario Brothers celebrates its 35th anniversary. And it's also the 30th anniversary of Super Mario Brothers 3, at least in Japan, which is my favorite video game of all time. And uh, the Bottleneck Gallery in New York is celebrating everything Mario with an amazing art show. And the link is in the show notes so that you can see some of the art and even purchase uh, some of it if you're interested. And uh, as frequent viewers of the show know, I love Mario more than almost anything. So I had to celebrate my favorite plumber and his cooler uh, brother Luigi. So check out uh, the links to all this cool art that you see up uh, above in the show notes. Well, that does it for me. If you like this video, hit that like button on YouTube and subscribe so that you can get all the latest Microsoft developer content. And let me know your favorite Mario game in the comments. See you next week.